Our session this afternoon is focused on an important topic, one that has been very prominent of late, and that is family housing. The controversy and policy discussions regarding privatized military housing have certainly raised the awareness of how we ensure quality housing for all military families. The Association of Defense Community believes that every service member and family member deserves quality, safe, and affordable housing. There's no argument about that. And we all need to be accountable for how we make that happen. When I say all of us, I'm talking the communities, the services, installation leaders, and our housing partners. The Military Housing Privatization Initiative has had a very positive impact on housing across the country. We need to continue to build on this effort while ensuring its continued outcomes. We must continue to move forward, not backwards. And while the issues, be they real or perceived, facing on-base housing are critical, the fact is that 70 percent of our families live in the community surrounding our military installations. So as defense communities, ensuring quality, safe, and affordable housing is one of the most important functions we provide. I know that from personal experience for communities that try to impact a local housing market, and when I say impact, I mean that could be studying the issue or regulating housing or getting directly involved, and you'll hear a little bit about that during our second panel this afternoon. And that is not an easy task, but we just cannot hope that the, the open market solves all of the issues because it will not. So beginning with this session, ADC will be exploring the issue of off-base housing over the next year. Now, we hope to be able to launch a more formal initiative in the months ahead, but to begin our discussion, uh, we've organized two great panels this afternoon, and again, we're going to divide it into two parts. The, the first will be a discussion with our military leaders and a representative from the privatized housing partner community to help us understand briefly the current issues impacting on-base housing. And then we'll hear from a diverse group of experts to discuss how we can ensure our off-base housing is high quality. If you sat through the last panel, you heard the two first panelists, and so I'll please ask to welcome to the stage uh, Secretary Jordan Gillis. He's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Installations, Energy, and Environment. Uh, Secretary John Henderson, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Energy, Installations, and Environment. And John Ale from Hunt Military Communities. Gentlemen, welcome. And as I said, we're not going to make this a he said, she said, or whatever, so, oh, this is good. You switch places for this panel so that we can <laughs> start with the Army. So what I would like to do is to start with the Army and the Air Force very, uh, very, very briefly. Um, you know, the controversies regarding on-post military housing have been on everybody's mind since those issues kind of surfaced and emerged at the beginning of the year, I guess in about the February time frame. So it's been a fast-moving issue, uh, and I know that you've analyzed it, so now that you've had a chance to understand the problem a little bit more closely, can each of you address, uh, help us understand what happened, and then tell us what the problem is? Secretary Gillis, start with you. Sure. Well, uh, you know, if you heard the Secretary of the Army's comments when he spoke at lunch, you heard that one of his enduring principles or enduring priorities is taking care of soldiers and their families. And uh, I, I assure you, he takes that very seriously. And as soon as we realize the scope and scale of this problem, uh, he and other Army senior leaders have been very focused on it. And so, uh, I, you know, how did it happen or where did it come from? You know, I think uh, from our level, we saw reports come in and didn't quite connect the dots. And so the first signs of trouble, if, if you will, were some things related to lead-based paint. And then I, I heard some concerns with mold at housing at West Point. So it, we thought we had a lead-based paint problem or we thought we had a mold at West Point problem not a problem with Army housing writ large. And I think it was pretty quickly evident that the problem was bigger than a couple of small issues or isolated issues or isolated installations. So that's how it evolved. Once we realized what we were dealing with, we, uh, not, not to brag on ourselves, but I think we addressed it very quickly. The, one of the first things we did was institute 100% visits of 
folks in, in housing, and not just housing, when I say housing, I mean barracks as well. So the chain of command got out, made contact with folks who were living in, in barracks and, and housing, and that's chain of command involvement is probably one of the most important things we could do. So that was the first thing. The next thing we did, every installation held a town hall meeting and continues to hold quarterly town hall meetings where residents can come and interface directly with the garrison teams, with the uh, housing partner teams, with the Department of Public Works folks, all the relevant kind of uh, municipal services people on the installation. We also established at each installation a hotline that goes right to the installation leadership team. So if a resident has a problem that hasn't been resolved through one of the typical channels, like calling in a work order, going to the housing office, they can escalate directly to a hotline that, that goes to the, uh, the garrison or the installation team. And I can verify garrison commanders are still taking those phones that answer that hotline home over the weekend. So they're, they're out there and they're effective. One of the other things we did was undelegated or, or brought back to headquarters department of the Army uh, the discretion to award incentive fees to our private housing partners. That, uh, that relieved the garrison commanders of some of that responsibility and relieved them of, of what many considered were kind of constraints that were artifacts of the agreements that were, that were in place. Uh, we also, I'm going I'm to list three more. I can't just keep going all day. I'm, I'm going to do three more things. We also uh, instituted a hotline where folks who believe they have health problems that are somehow related to their homes can call, and that'll link them up. We'll use that to link them up to health professionals that can address their, address their situation. Then we and our installation uh, housing partners, the privatized partners, have all increased our staffing, both from an oversight standpoint at Army and from a customer service standpoint at most of the partners. And then finally, we have a uh, housing satisfaction survey that was previously done annually uh, that all residents are afforded an opportunity to participate in. We increased the frequency of that to twice annually. Uh, so we, we think that across those immediate actions that we took and, and then some things I'm sure that we'll talk about later, we've. Uh, We've initially addressed the crisis pretty well. Uh, thanks, sir. Now, Secretary Henderson, from the Air Force perspective, what, what happened? Yeah, so uh, I think from the Air Force perspective, um, for, first of all, I just have to say that the Air Force takes the health and safety of our airmen and their families very seriously. So uh, when this came up, we took it very seriously, and, and our, actions, our actions to date show that. But it's not just about the health and safety of our airmen and families and privatized housing, it's dorms, it's the facilities we work in, it's the places they live downtown, uh, which we'll talk about later. But uh, um, this, this, is a, this is a leader responsibility, the health and safety. And if for some reason or another, you know, if, if when, when our airmen raise these issues to their leaders in their chain of command or to uh, the, the folks that are supposed to fix that and, and, and they're not being addressed appropriately. We, we, we all live and work in, in older infrastructure. Um, in the infrastructure business, uh, these issues come up, but it's completely unacceptable where it's not being addressed appropriately. And I think what we found in this is there's, one, it varied by base. A lot of our bases are doing very well, and a lot of the people that we partner with uh, for our facilities are, are doing a great job out there. So I'll just highlight that up front. But in the places we were having uh, real issues, I mean, real substantive issues, a lot of times there were communications issues, either internal to the management or between the, the residents and the management or between the residents and their, and their leadership, frankly. Um, uh, in some cases, we were having just uh, uh, some quality assurance issues with the oversight of, of the maintenance that was getting done, either the maintenance management system in itself, how we were managing the work orders, or uh, when the work was getting done, sometimes, uh, um, I just, just to speak frankly, it was probably getting done incompetently. Um, and then there, there, was this, there was this feeling by airmen and their families that uh, um, there weren't strong advocates out there. When there was problems, there wasn't, the things weren't getting resolved in, in some of these spaces where we're having issues. Uh, they just didn't feel like that their, the advocacy was there. I think for the realization for this, because it's such, uh, it's such an important issue when you're talking about safety and health, which translates into uh, the retention of families and then a readiness issue and so on. Um, or the readiness issue, uh, just in the distraction from work. If you're busy, if you're worried about uh, the conditions your family's living in or the, the, the fact that your families are getting hassled, 
um, when you're deployed forward somewhere, that becomes a readiness issue. That's a distraction. So um, we took this very seriously. And I think we realized that um, not just handling the situation is important, but how we handle this situation really determines whether we, we deserve the trust of our airmen and of, and of our nation to, to handle stuff like this or whether we need outside help. So, um, so going forward, much like the Army, we did, we did 100% housing review, which, which essentially put the chain of command in direct contact with about 56,000 uh, of our residents, of, uh, of Air Force residents. And, and privatized housing, and we actually we went into the, the housing that we managed to overseas. Um, that resulted in follow-ups, the chain of command follow-ups going into the house on about 10,000 of those instances, over 10,000 of those instances, and then we generated, uh, they validated health and safety concerns or, or uh, concerns in the house that needed to be fixed, and that generated about um, 52 or 5,300 work orders that we've been uh, micromanaging and getting them worked off and taken care of. and so. That was an effort to really, uh, when this, this broke and, and some Reuters reporting, we had to go out and say, what's, what's really the extent of the problem? And before we start putting solutions into place, uh, let's take a responsible approach. Let's identify the extent of the problem, the scope of the problem, and that'll help inform uh, our solutions to that. So, um, you know, from there, you know, we took, uh, in addition to just fixing the immediate issues, um, we're working with the other services on this Bill of Rights, right, uh, for solutions. And we're getting after this to, to help with some of these communications issues, just a general understanding of what the, the rights are, whether it's uh, uh, the advocacy, whether it's legal assistance, whether it's their right to responsive communications and, and prompt repairs, uh, no cost moves in the case that the quarters become unhabitable, uh, or just a well-defined dispute resolution process and fee structures and so on. So this is, this is something that, uh, that we've drafted. Uh, we're getting ready to put this out to the residents to get their feedback and so that we understand where they f how they feel about the Bill of Rights and, and, and incorporate that into um, uh, the final version. But we've worked with our project owners on this. We've worked with congressional committees on this. We've worked with military advocacy groups. We think this is a great document and an excellent start to fix some of what we thought were foundational issues with the program. Additionally, uh, in those cases, you know, uh, we're not, uh, none of us are perfect. In those cases where the resident does not feel like they're getting the answer they want or not getting the level of communications that we want, we did put a 24 seven hotline on uh, so that they can call and get some resolution or get some just answers to questions or just get pointed in the right directions connected with the resources they need. Additionally, we're giving them more voice with regard to resident satisfaction surveys and connecting that with uh, performance incentive fee structures so that the residents have a bigger voice in the service that they're getting from uh, our, our project owners on base. And then finally, with regard to improving this communications and empowering residents, um, uh, we're, we're establishing resident advisory councils for our wing commanders so that they, they understand and can get kind of firsthand accounts uh, of what's going on. Uh, there was some, we, we noticed in some cases uh, we could do, do better with some of our oversight, so we're working with the project owners on the work order process itself uh, and automating that process so that your work order gets put into the system and initiated when the, when the resident calls it in. Uh, so on a, an automated that the, that the private sector uses pretty prolifically. Um, it gets put in there, it's transparent, it gets tracked, and as they step through the, the work order process, the resident or our Air Force oversight can go in and look and see the status of the work order or even draw uh, look at the overall management uh, of the process. And then additionally, on both the, the project owner side and the, the Air Force side, we're increasing staffing to, to help with this kind of in, increased logistics, whether it's uh, overseeing uh, the quality assurance of the work that's getting done or overseeing the systems itself. And then finally, we're doing a number of things to uh, strengthen the commander involvement and better integrate our commanders and chain of command into into uh, what's been privatized housing management. And it's primarily done essentially with our Air Force Civil Engineer Center, but while the management and the programmatics happen centrally, uh, there's, there's certainly roles and responsibilities because health, the health and safety of our airmen and their families is always a leader responsibility and commander responsibility, and just making sure that we know where the, the boundaries and seams are there is, is important for all of us uh, to do better with that. So anyway, just kind of a few thoughts on uh, what we, where we found maybe some root uh, some root causes and some of the things we're doing to address those. So, Mr. Ale, from the uh, you know from the privatized partners perspective, uh, can you give? A, now, I mean, uh, not you don't speak for all partners, and I'm not asking you to do that. But can you give us a perspective from a privatized partner, your view of what happened? Well, yeah, yeah. From solely from Hunt's perspective, um, you know, we first of all we we welcome the conversation that's taking place around military housing right now. 
Uh, when the legislation was put in place in 96, the DOD was facing a lot of issues, and I think the program has been very successful over those 20 plus years in addressing, I would say, the majority of the issues they faced at that point in time. But a lot has happened in 20 years. It's, you know, you think about the impact of the internet in the last 20 years. You think about the fact that we've seen the longest wartime period in U.S. history during that time. Uh, we're in a different world right now, and, and residents have different needs and, and expectations. So. Uh, we think that this is a great time to re-examine the program in total and, and really figure out where we can make it better and be more effective for the, uh, for the residents and their, their living experience. So uh, we think this is a great time to do that. You know, my sense, just in working with, with all the stakeholders, the departments, the, the, the other project owners, uh, the residents, is that there is uh, a reinvigorated uh, commitment to to the service to the service uh, to the residents, um, I think that there is a more uh, a cohesive look among all the stakeholders than there probably ever has been. So I think that that more comprehensive and and, and uh, all encompassing look at this is going to benefit the residents first and foremost, and really all of the stakeholders. So, you know, with that said, you know, at Hunt, we're obviously committed to providing safe, healthy, and quality homes. That's the first and foremost. It's you do what's best for the service member. And now with that said also, that housing is not maintenance free. I've said that before. And Hunt's not perfect. You know, we, we have issues that arise. We take responsibility for it, we tackle it, we, we get it resolved, but we're not always perfect. And, and you know, we, we are constantly striving to put improvements in place to make sure that we're, we're, we're avoiding those mistakes in the future and learning from past mistakes. Um, where we typically have seen um, in cases where we've, we've maybe fallen short of resident expectations, what we've typically seen is it is a communications breakdown. Um, you know, either a misunderstanding has been created, uh, an expectation has been set and then not met or not met timely. You know, if, if you look at uh, the way the communication has changed in recent years, we're trying to keep up on all this stuff and improve our communications to avoid the breakdowns. Uh, because it's, you know, ultimately what, what we need to do is make sure that our residents are comfortable coming to us with their issues and they're confident in us that we're going to resolve their issues to their satisfaction. So, Secretary Anderson, you mentioned the Tenant Bill of Rights, and we've, we've heard a lot about the Tenant Bill of Rights, and I'll let you amplify in a second, but I'm going to put Secretary Gillis on the spot, uh, and then come back to the private sector partner and talk a little bit about Tenant Bill of Rights and yeah. whether you think that can solve the problem and, and is that the way to move forward. So I, I, I do, and, uh, but not, not by itself. So what the Tenant Bill of Rights really does is act as an aspirational document and in fairly plain language, let residents know what they can expect and, and what their rights are. Um, but, but by itself, that can't do a whole lot. And, and so really the next step with that is to codify it or operationalize it. And the way we intend to do that is mostly through a standardized tenant lease that we, the services, and all of our partners are working with to at least have a base document that is fairly consistent installation to installation that then makes into law those things that we have set forth in the Bill of Rights. Probably not all of the things in the Bill of Rights would belong in a lease. They'll, they'll go elsewhere, whether that is an agreement between the Army and each partner, or, or the services and each of their partners, or whatever, but we're gonna capture all those things to to then give them teeth. And, and that'll really be what makes the Bill of Rights uh, something that works and makes things better. So two, two things on that. Uh, one, we expect within the next week or two that that's gonna go out to all the current residents of privatized military housing for their review and feedback. Um, like Mr. Henderson said, we've been working with Congress, we've gotten some feedback from them, uh, we've gotten some preliminary feedback from some of the uh, military and veteran service organizations but expect more, and so that'll make a good Bill of Rights, and then we'll, we'll codify it or operationalize it to make it good. The other thing uh, then to mention, though, is that it's still not something we can fix overnight. Um, so all of the processes, procedures, agreements, leases, that is all necessary stuff, but really this is what we, what we the services, are dealing with, I think, is we have lost the trust and the confidence of our residents and so we have to gain that back, and that is not going to be an overnight thing. That'll take time uh, for folks to see that we've 
put our money where our mouth is and that things are, in fact, getting better. Secretary Henderson, anything you want to add? And I want to ask both of you, do you see this being service specific or is this DOD wide that you would see an agreement that airmen and, and, and soldiers basically are treated the same? We're working really hard to make this a tri-service bill of rights that all the project owners, uh, so that's why we're doing this in collaboration with the project owners. A lot of them, there's, there's different, um, there's different partnerships, different mm -hmm. fee structures. It's different between the three services. But this is the one thing that we're trying to make commons because all of our service members live on each other's bases, right? Mm -hmm. So on any given base, uh, we'll have service members of every service. So as, as they move, just because they move, that shouldn't result in some uh, foundational change in, in, in their renting experience on base, so to speak. Um, complicated with a lot of our members, uh, you know, a lot of our members are young. Uh, sometimes it's their first time ever renting anything. Um, and so, and, and first time having to take care of a, a house and a home. So uh, there's a piece of that that's, you know, in addition to understanding what their rights are, uh, and there's some of it that's, that has to do with what's the responsibilities of, of being a renter and being at home. No, that, that's not, this is not, uh, you know, some new, something new. This is already in the lease, but it's buried in the lease, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those 50 pages you sign when you, uh, you, you go in and sign for quarters. So in addition to uh, having, um, one, a, a common bill of rights that we all agree on, three services and the project owners, um, uh, that makes sense. Uh, the, secondly, is making sure that we've communicated that to them. Make sure that, so just because uh, in the uh, scheme of all communication, just because we send the message doesn't mean it's received or re internalized or, or fully understood. So part of the Part of our plan to add additional personnel, some of those personnel that would go out to be at our base would be the resident advocates. And we, we see them in this role that after you sign a lease or after you sign in, maybe at a 30-day follow-up or a 60-day follow-up, they sit back down and go through, here's what the light addendum says. Here's what the mold addendum says. Here's, here's some of the responsibilities for you. Here's, what, here's your bill of rights. Let me go back through this to you and see if you have any questions. Let me help you with the walkthrough of your quarters to make sure that you've captured everything that's wrong with it and the work orders are getting followed up on. And, and, and let's, let's talk about your experience face to face and have an actual person do that, um, either from the Air Force or the project owner. But uh, right now we're envisioning someone from the Air Force at least going out and, and, and doing some of that stuff. So, um, yeah, so um, yeah, for the for the Bill of Rights, we think that's extremely important. I don't know, and then we're, like I said, we're trying to get to a standard lease. Uh, that, that might be a baseline document lease, then, and then, um, you know, we have to deal with different regulatory markets and state and local landlord renter uh, laws and stuff, so that would have to be added as addendums and, and so on from there, but anyway, yeah. that's where so we're So, Mr. Ale, from the, from the partner's perspective, uh, your thoughts on the Tenant Bill of Rights? Yeah, we've, we've, as with, you know, there have been any number of initiatives that are being contemplated right now in this conversation, and, and um, you know, my, my co-panelists over here have touched on a couple of them beyond the Resident Bill of Rights. So as, as with all of those, we're supportive of these initiatives. I, I think that these will go a long way toward improving the experience for residents. The Resident Bill of Rights is certainly one of those that we're supportive of. Um, you know, somewhat, as Mr. Gillis pointed out, it's, you know, we look at it as a ref reflection of the lease. Now, not everything in the Bill of Rights is in the lease, but everything in the lease should be in the Bill of Rights, you know, as far as the rights of the tenant. And that lease being a, a legal document with teeth that outlines in detail the responsibilities and the rights of both the resident and the landlord. So, um, I think the Resident Bill of Rights is, is a kind of a high level, convenient, easy to understand, easy to use reference point to make sure that the residents have a full understanding of what their rights are. And if they need to understand any particular right deeper, they just dig into to the lease. And further on to what uh, both of, of my co-panelists have said, um, that common lease is key for that. Because if you're taking a consistent bill of rights from place to place, the lease has got to be the same. Uh, I, as a benefit to the tenants and to our residents, when they PCS to their next location, it just helps a little bit more to be able to look at a document and see, oh, that's familiar, I've seen this before, rather than having another point of stress out of them of saying, I don't know what this means, and honestly, no one likes the reading leases. So it's, um, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a positive, and we're very supportive. Great. So we're gonna bring up another panel here in a second to, to talk a little bit about off post, but I guess to have you all wrap up this particular session, tell me a year from now, let's say the next uh, national summit, where do you think you'll be as a service on this particular issue? 
Well, so I, you know, I think that we in the Army have reached a turning point, and I think a year from now, it'll be a good news story. Uh, this is something that we have tackled very hard. I, I think we have the right things in place. I think with a year of runtime, uh, residents will see the improvements and they'll they'll feel differently, and it'll it'll be a good news story. I mean, this is. Uh, you know, for me, and I, and I know for Mr. Henderson as well, this isn't an academic or a abstract uh, problem. I mean, this is this is real. So I'm wearing a suit right now, but I used to wear a uniform, and many of my friends are in these houses that we're talking about with their families, and, and that's that's where they live. And uh, so I, I owe it to them, just as I do to all of our other service members and, and other residents, to to get this right. And we're working very hard to do it. So, uh, like Jordan, my, uh, my family and I uh, spent many years in, in military housing, uh, pre-privatized and post-privatized. Lived in a few hunt houses by by coincidence, <laughs> along the way, and we uh, and. So we've seen some of the challenges along. We've seen some of the goodness uh, transitioning from the old to the new, and that's worth acknowledging here. Overall, for, for DOD housing, uh, from where we were in the, the early to mid-90s to where we are now, there's a huge improvement. That doesn't mean we can't continue to improve and make it better uh, now that we've gotten to where we're at. But as far as where I think we'll be in a year from now, I think we'll have uh, an approved operationalized bill of rights. Uh, I'd like to see us uh, have come to, uh, come to ground on a common lease. Um, I think at least for the Air Force, we'll have revamped our performance incentive fee structures to give our residents and commanders more of a voice in, in that. Um, I don't know what that looks like just yet, but we're going to continue working on it. Um, I think uh, we did an internal assessment with our IG that look, looked at a number of policy procedures, best practices, uh, things that we can improve on. And so internally, the Air Force, we're going we're gonna to go through a long list of uh, uh, and just some internal uh, improvements that, that we know that we can do better. Uh, so I'd like to see some of those codified by that time in policy because at the end of the day, uh, while this, this is certainly an emergent issue, uh, I think uh, uh, one of the things strategically is we want to make sure this emergent issue, we put enduring solutions on. It's not some knee-jerk reaction where we go and fix a bunch of stuff and two years from now uh, we're having repeat problems. That would be a, a total disservice to our, our airmen and our families and it would be a waste of money. So there's this, this nuance to take in the energy that we have now, this, the support of Congress that we have right now, um, and if we, if we let that go. So we need to codify this into permanent policy and, re and regulations and ensure that our, our agreements endure uh, for the rest of these partnerships. And from the private partners perspective a year from now? Well, I, I uh, agree with a lot of what's, what's been said here, because um, particularly Mr. Henderson's comment that, that this is not a, a, a short term. This is, a, this is an ongoing dialogue and will continue because we do have an opportunity right now. We've got a lot of attention on this. Everyone's aligned that we've got a great program that can get better. Um, so all these things are being put in place for the long run. You know, we're here hunting it for the long run. Um, you know, that's been our focus. And, and we've, in addition to a number of issues that we've put in place and, and resolved that, that uh, we think will make our resident experience better. You know, I, we have, you know, it's important to note that we've got over 50% of Hunt's employees are military affiliated, and almost all of them are on site and direct service to the residents. So they understand military life and, and can be empathetic toward that. Um, but it is on us to, to give our employees all the tools they need to make sure they deliver when, when our residents need them. And so we're working on, on multiple fronts, both giving a, our residents the voice that they need and, and should have, and making sure it's heard, and making sure our employees are armed to, to help them when they need it. So I, th I think uh, a year from now we'll be in a much better place. It's my pleasure to welcome our second panel. And I'll ask them to, to come in as I introduce them. Greg Doyen is a member of the ADC Board of Directors, and he is the city manager of Great Falls, Montana. Now, Mike Kingsella is the executive director of Up for Growth. Uh, Kathy Roth Duque is the CEO of uh, Blue Star Families. And Douglas Lawson is uh, the executive director of the Partner Engineer and Science. Oh, we got five chairs out here now. How did we da how'd that happen? That's amazing. Okay. Let me come over there then. So uh, a lot of questions I'll ask and then let you all kind of pile on one another if in fact you choose to do so. You say, <laughs> I got a question for you about it. I want to answer that one. I want to amplify something else. That's fine. 
Mr. Lawson, I want to kind of start with you. I know that your company worked very closely with the military on dealing with the aftermath of the mm -hmm. housing issues on both, uh, including supporting um, um, the town halls that were held across the country yep. in, in various installations. So what have you learned from the town halls and your work with the military services on, on this issue? Well, as, as a bit of background first, the. Uh, uh, interesting to choice the word aftermath. I don't think we've gotten to aftermath yet. We're still working uh, in real time at uh, four bases over about the last nine months. And although the work we've been doing at each base has been a little different depending on the needs, it's all fallen under the, the heading of what I would call environmental issues that, that contribute to having quality housing on these bases. The, the town halls have been an interesting experience, uh, overall very helpful. And for those bases where we've had multiple town meetings, uh, town hall meetings, maybe one a month, the initial meetings were, I'd say, used by a lot of the residents to uh, vent some frustration and, and express their concerns about the, the quality of their housing. As time went on and we had spent more time on the base and done more assessments and gotten remediation accomplished and, and closed out those issues, the, the tenor of, of the town hall meetings changed dramatically and became more of a dialogue and an open discussion between the owner, managers, and the residents and representatives of our staff who were present. And so that's become, I'd say, at this point now, eight or nine months down the road, a really key part of the program for keeping the residents in the loop and for providing some, some direct feedback to our staff. Okay. So, Kathy, we all know about the Blue Star Family Survey that goes out every year. So can you talk briefly about what you saw in the Blue Star Family Survey that went out and anything specific about military housing? What, what, what are the family members telling Blue Star Families? Sure. One of the benefits of us doing this survey annually is we can see trends and we can see concerns coming up. What we saw this past year was that for the first time, military housing was a top concern for military families. And that hadn't been the case before. Um, we give an opportunity for families to write in open-ended responses. We don't pre-choose their, their um, decisions. That's expensive for us, but it lets us see what's coming. We had a very high percentage of people write in concerns about military housing, about privatized housing in particular, and about housing issues. It wasn't limited to that. Um, about a third of people experienced um, dissatisfaction with on-base housing, not necessarily right now, but any time during their career. Um, and then the cost of housing, BAH, was uh, a high concern as well. So, Mr. King, so I'll come back to you in just a second. I want to get uh, Mr. Doy in to talk a little bit about uh, their program in Great Falls because, you know, Greg, you, you had a housing availability issue in, in Great Falls and decided to tackle it head on. So, the, you know, what, what can the defense communities here learn from what you did in Great Falls? Sure. And Bill, I'm sorry for taking your seat. I no, realize I just right. did that. <laughs> and good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you here. You know, a few years ago, the mission support group commander came in to share a story about an airman that was living in substandard uh, housing conditions in one of the units in Great Falls where they had a space heater that was very close to the sleeping area for this uh, airmen and uh, something caught on fire and the airman ended up severely burning his hands trying to put this uh, out. It just illustrated this really acute need in the community um, about the types of housing that we have and the quality of that housing. You know, over the years, the city has heard some anecdotal type stories like that and we have heard from our installation leadership that there's been concerns about housing availability outside the gate from Malmstrom Air Force Base. And in order to describe our housing situation a little bit better, you have to understand this is Montana. We have about a million people there. Great Falls is about 60,000. Malmstrom Air Force Base is actually outside of uh, Great Falls uh, city limits, just by about a half a mile or so. And so it's a rural, urban, uh, unique market in central Montana. So my comments are based on that to keep some perspective. And cumulatively, the community started acknowledging that, you know, number one, we have a workforce, a work housing shortage uh, that for quality and affordable housing just for workers that are coming into the area. And the state had seen an oil boom in the last couple of years, which affected some of that. And um, 
I'd like to say, honestly, that we were thinking about the base first, but organically and naturally through this process of just evaluating everything, some of the groups uh, in the community stepped up, nonprofits, uh, the public organizations, and um, also developers who wanted to test the waters a little bit and say, we've been successful in other areas of Montana. Could we model something similarly in Great Falls and make that successful? Mm -hmm. So we had this arsenal of studies that complemented uh, each other, and uh, efforts uh, were underway to convince developers that there is a market for improved housing here, for one thing. And secondly, for those more affordable units, some of the nonprofits took that on as well, and we've been able to successfully add several hundred new units into the uh, portfolio for Great Falls, which has helped ease, hasn't resolved it, but it has helped ease some of those issues. Yeah. So, so Mike, from your perspective, because you're, you have a unique nonprofit organization up for growth, this housing availability and affordability is not necessarily limited to just military communities. So tell us what you're seeing in terms of national trends in this regard. No, that's right. The, what I'm hearing from this panel is very consistent with what we hear from stakeholders throughout the country. Uh, Up for Growth, by way of background, is a national nonprofit coalition-driven organization spanning roughly 15 stakeholder categories, from environmentalists to developers, from major employers to social justice advocates. Uh, urban to rural, suburban and exurban communities are represented by our membership, and the common thread is this lack of housing affordability and availability. And, and so Up for Growth is, is very much focused on moving policy that gets at the root cause of this, this housing challenge across the country. From a big national picture, we have seen a systematic underproduction of housing accumulating over the past 15, 20 years. From 2000 to 2015, our research found that the nation as a whole has fallen 7.3 million homes short of meeting housing needs. And that's driven by you know, clearly uh, a lack of uh, construction uh, workforce uh, that is uh, deteriorating in terms of pro productivity, even in the face of advancements in building means and methods, uh, a lack of available land for housing uh, uh, writ large across the country, uh, a lack of capital uh, to finance the construction of affordable homes all the way up to market rate, multifamily and single family. Uh, and, so, and so this challenge uh, has driven a real shortage of housing, which has exacerbated uh, a, a, an affordability challenge, particularly since 2008. You know, we pulled the stats nationwide, and 50% of renter households pay more than 30% of their gross paycheck on rent, and a full quarter percent, uh, or for, full 25% of American renter households pay more than half of their gross paycheck on rent. And so with uh, a, a military family population where 80% are living off base, that forces tough decisions for households, whether or not to live close to the base and pay a real premium and potentially cost burden themselves, or live further and further from the base until they can find a home that they can afford, which of course carries costs from a readiness perspective and from the perspective of just simply quality of life. So, Kathy, I'd like to come back to you and the Blue Star families for a second and then ask Mr. Lawson to kind of pile onto that if appropriate. You know, this issue kind of started as a grassroots effort. It bubbled up from the grassroots. Um, and obviously, Blue Star families tries to work at the grassroots level. So what is it that communities need to know about grassroots and informal networks, specifically in the military, that might be useful for them going forward? To the extent that um, the communities are in, in military and civilian roundtables, I think being supportive of the idea of having local advocates for these military families at their community level, because the families need to have those advocates. Each individual family can't solve this as their own problem, but if we need systems of support. Um, also, to the extent that there are um, landlords uh, in the local community, recognizing that military housing is a top concern for military families, a top stressor, particularly short notice on um, PCS moves and on orders, so that the more it's possible to be flexible with military families in your community, the more helpful that is. A lot of these solutions are really going to be between the installations and the privatized housing companies. So, Mr. Lawson, I know that uh, you've worked a lot with the services uh, in doing the, the installation town halls for privatized housing. Um, but 
Describe the grassroots effort where this came from, what you all saw in terms of, of that, and, and what lessons learned from, the, uh, from that can the communities take away from this? Lessons learned. The, the work that we've been doing at the, at the various military bases is no different than work we've been doing for private sector clients in uh, multifamily housing uh, for 20 or 30 years. It just has, I think, become a, a, you know, a mainstream issue uh, recently. And we see, uh, again, the same kinds of environmental issues we deal with in other housing, from lead-based paint to asbestos to radon, water intrusion, mold, uh, pest infestation, and a variety of things. And I think this, this grassroots movement has, has elevated the visibility of these things to a point where while we're now taking care of the, uh, the situations unit by unit, base by base, I think we're poised to start developing proactive programs and transition from a reactive nature to proactive where each base would have a program. And I think it's important to have consistent programs because so many of the military families do move from base to base as they're reassigned. And, if they are familiar with a program at one base and the program's the same at the next base, it just makes it easier for implementation and for everyone to, to buy in. Um, communication has been key, and that's where the, the town halls come in, where people are able to voice their opinions, but also um, get feedback as to what's being done. And we've found kind of interestingly, as people have gotten familiar with our staff and, and seeing them on site, when we drive our, our truck into a neighborhood, people see us, they know we're there to do inspections, and they even, if they're walking down the street, will stop and say hi. And so we've kind of become a, a fixture, and I think that's really increased the, the trust level among the, the residents. So if we can move now into more of a proactive, where we have a multi-tiered program, which includes training and education and communication, um, having a third-party firm like ourselves on the sideline to handle technical issues, you know, should they come up, and I think that will be a, a big part of the program. Right. So I'd ask you two to comment if you want to comment about the grassroots piece of it, or if you want to talk a little bit more about what states and communities can do to ensure that there's available sure. a, and, and affordable housing. Sure, I'll, I'll pop in a little bit on, on that front. I think uh, the uh, effort was good on the studies, but then you need to uh, put those studies into action. And so uh, one of the challenges was convincing developers that there was an opportunity out there. And the interesting thing about Malmstrom Air Force Base is there is a lot of land to develop around it. Uh, water, sewer, utilities are out there uh, ready to go and to be connected and they just needed to understand that there was a need. And I just think sometimes there's a lot of misconception about what happens at, on the installation versus what happens outside the gate in terms of housing because there was a massive renovation of the housing at Moms from Air Force Base and I think just people probably perceive that, hey, their housing is all taken care of, you know, we're good to go here, maybe there's not an opportunity. They didn't understand that that housing doesn't serve all the folks that are stationed uh, at that facility. And I think, in general, the housing market uh, in Gray Falls has been very uh, tight. And I can't say that that's deliberate, but I can say that, you know, when there's less availability, you know, people are generating a pretty good income off of that. They're not motivated uh, to make improvements to the to their rental units, which unfortunately the airmen have to live in and deal with. And some of the introduction of competition in the mix, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with a developer, saying, listen, there's a real need here, there's a real opportunity if you would take the risk uh, to look at it. And it has created some competition, as I said, with the housing units that have started earlier. And uh, I think it's forced some of the kind of slumlords, if you will, they've had to improve their stock. But a few other quick things. Um, it's been a while since uh, Malmstrom has done a, you gotta love military acronyms, it's a Housing Requirement Market Analysis, or HERMA. And so I think that they're realizing that what they have is currently outdated, and a few years ago they might have recognized that maybe they needed to look at their BAH, but there's a lot of requirements before they start talking about whether or not that needs to be expanded. I know that Malmstrom just uh, did its own in-house review, and I'm hoping that that'll turn into something a little bit larger, Global Strike Command, to take a look at all the opportunities that we have out there. There was, um, the housing at Malmstrom is also privatized, and so there was an effort by uh, the company 
to do kind of a move the gate situation with some unaccompanied housing. Uh, that got stopped early on. I'm not sure I understand all the nuances of why. I think that they're waiting for something happening at Edwards Air Force Base. If there's anybody out there that knows anything about housing, um, I'd be interested to hear whether or not that's been a success or whether or not that's um, been stalled. But there really is this uh, perception and a reality uh, issue, and then there's just this fundamental lack of coordination between the community and the installation in terms of long-range planning. So this is hard to overcome, right? We've all had consultants that have talked about that have come into the community, and they're very narrowly focused, and even though you may introduce other things like housing, they're like, we can't touch that. That's not part of our mandate. So what I would just say to communities is, is that when you go back and you take a look at your growth management plan or your comprehensive land use plan, you've got, to be, you've got to be real and you've got to include your military community as part of that. Now, some may do that naturally, but I don't think a lot do, and they may not go into the weeds a little bit on the housing piece of it, which I think is uh, critically important for folks to do. And there's also opportunities for uh, tax credit development to incentivize uh, development that may occur around an installation if the market shows that there's a need for it. We've had some nonprofit groups that specialize in workforce housing also take up the mantle uh, because they understand that there's enough market to make that investment as well. So just a few things to yeah. consider. Uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, there's a real tell of two cities. We were, we were talking about this backstage, that there are certain places that with an acute housing crisis that's not driven by a preponderance of artificial barriers, but instead of lack of feasibility to move needed housing forward. You know, Great, Great Falls, for example, 45% of renter households pay more than 30% of their gross paycheck on rent. But there's a lot, there's a lot of availability there that could be potentially leveraged um, and, how, and the question is, how do you attract and how do you create incentives to do economic development with housing in these communities? And so there's a few precedent examples amongst our network that we've seen. Uh, Columbus, Nebraska is always an example I like to point to. It's a community about 80 miles west of Omaha, about 80,000 people. And they found that they weren't able to attract their workforce, the engine of their economy manufacturing because they're in a very similar situation. Housing is just unavailable and unaffordable. And so that community leveraged a, a fairly clever uh, public-private partnership technique centered around tax increment financing and leveraging community assets to create more subsidy uh, to make possible middle-income housing for the workforce that they want and the employers that they want to attract. And so I think examples like that exist in military communities like Spokane, Washington, uh, leveraging uh, tax abatement tools. So thinking about what are the tools in the toolbox, what are the strategies that local governments can employ to make more housing pencil uh, is a big part of the solution. You heard Secretary Gillis and Secretary Henderson talk about the Tenant Bill of Rights uh, with the private sector partner in terms of implementing that for privatized military housing. Um, kind of a thorny issue, but do you see Tenant Bill of Rights moving to the 70% of soldiers, airmen, marine sailors that are living off of the installation? Um, and, and some of the pitfalls when you begin to regulate your rental market off post or off base uh, by imposing things like tenant bill of rights, which are on the installation. Do you see problems with that, or do you see is that as a, as a positive thing? Greg, let me start with you. Yeah, well, I think the first thing that comes to my mind uh, on that, and I'm not really that familiar with, with the bill of rights, but uh, we talk a lot about readiness. And so if somebody is living in substandard housing conditions, <laughs> where is their head going to be at when they're dealing with some of the issues that they need to deal with at work? and uh, what are, is going to be on their mind in terms of what their family is having to live with as well, if it's a multifamily or a family situation. So I guess uh, if you uh, take that leap from, you know, you've got a Bill of Rights, and does that affect how our men and women that are in the service, um, their, how they view their jobs, how they conduct themselves at work because of their home life, I guess you could see it extended to that level, especially in terms of readiness. Good. Kathy, anything to add on that? Yeah, when a military family lives overseas, you, the base is more involved in your off-base housing, your private off-base housing, and it, it helps you um, orient your comings and goings and how much they can charge and these kinds of things. I think there's a place for that because we do need a lot of housing in the community. There's an upside for the um, housing provider in that they are getting payment from the military um, installation or the, the, the military service. They're getting the BAH. So you can have, a, you know, like higher level than Section 8 housing, you can get some 
um, assuredness about the payment you're going to get. And I think these are creative ideas that we should explore because the more we can reduce the friction around housing for military families, not only will it increase, increase uh, readiness, but it will increase retention too because this is a reason people do leave. I would just echo Kathy's comments that uh, it, it, it's, it's critical to have uh, under, uh, let's take a step back a second. I mean, this, this challenge that military communities face is really a symptom of uh, a broken housing ecosystem. Uh, and until we really address the fundamental uh, challenges that are driving a lack of housing availability and affordability, we're going to continue to have these conversations. Now, having said that, clearly it's immediately you know, uh, critical to address this immediate challenge that facing you know, folks' substandard housing for anyone is not okay. And so thinking about you know, what are some sensible standards that should be in place to protect folks in the, in the immediate term is a reasonable conversation. Yeah. Doug, anything to add to that? Uh, just as I'm listening, I'm thinking that uh, one of the things we've, we've identified already in our, the work we've done is it's more, it's more complex in terms of dealing with the various players involved than when we work in the private sector. Uh, in, in the case of military housing, you, you have the, the resident, obviously, you have the military, and then you have the owner, and in some cases, a management firm that manages the property for the owner. And you have to get all of these people on the same page in order to get an effective program going. Um, while I think it's, it certainly should be the same if you're off base in private housing, that brings another potential player into the act, the person who owns that private housing, and he may or may not want to honor a tenant's bill of rights that someone else put together, and, and he sees it as imposing on him. And uh, likewise, he may, he may not be excited about um, someone like us coming in to uh, do a lead paint survey in, in his uh, residence or apartment building or whatever. So I don't, I'm not opposed to it by any stretch. I think it's a complexity that would have to be thought through. Right. So ADC thinks this is an important issue. So in closing, because the only thing between cold beer and, 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 and is me, okay, and I understand that. So. Um, so for the next 36 hours, at least, that I'm the president of this organization, uh, what, what can ADC do better to educate communities about this important issue? And anybody can tackle that one. Kathy. Um, Blue Star Families works a lot with ADC, and we would be delighted to work with any community, too, to better understand your um, military community. In nine um, states, we're going to be doing localized surveys this year with our new chapters that we're rolling out that will show what the strengths and stresses are of your military community in those areas. So we um, welcome you to partner with us on that. And in fact, partnership, public-private, nonprofit partnership is really the way forward on all of these issues. So that's our recommendation. I, I, I would have a similar comment in that we have a broken housing ecosystem. We have impediments to housing of all kinds across all types of communities, including military and defense communities. And so I would argue that this organization has a very powerful voice and should use its voice to advocate for policies that increase resources like the tax credit, the housing credit program to provide more affordable housing options near um, uh, posts and bases, and also break down these impediments to housing, whether that's uh, zoning restrictions or uh, uh, fees and costs associated with housing that could be streamlined or rationalized uh, to really get, the, get this issue of a lack of housing availability. Yeah, I think ADC, if uh, they could help bridge the processes between what the military uses to evaluate its housing needs. Uh, I think when I was doing a little research, there was like four separate processes that uh, the Air Force uses to evaluate and come to a conclusion about what should be out there in the community for housing stock. I don't even think that had anything to do with the BAH, which is always a part of the conversation. As a missile base, I think we have the lowest BAH. Uh, in the community, but we also have probably the least amount of available uh, stock for those airmen that are, are suffering from some of those quality uh, of life issues through, the, through their housing. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of a nuts and bolts guy, so just talking about the practical parts of this stuff, 
Um, how do you incorporate housing issues into a community's master plan as it relates to the military and making sure that uh, some of those tools are recognizable and that the folks that maybe have come and gone in an organization will go back and maintain those relationships with the base and vice versa? Because it's tough to sustain that when you have people coming in and out. And then all of a sudden when you know people figure out that there's a crisis, it's a little too late, it's really bad. And they need to go unwind when a little bit of preventative or proactive planning at the front end and probably would have saved a little bit of headache. You know, mission changes, uh, uh, increases, decreases, uh, different uh, needs at the installation, those are hard to keep up with, but if you get that to be part of how a community looks at its own housing model and you build that into those guiding documents, I think you're gonna create more awareness. So I'd like to see ADC maybe focus a little bit more on that. I think it'll be an issue that'll be around for ADC on its agenda for a while, and so with that, um, I hear the cold beer calling, so please join me in thanking our panel, both panels, for, uh, for their time. <laughs>